to uh, introduce uh, Bob Freiberg's picture uh, when he is going to talk. Um, Bob is very much a, a, a part of the international diabetic foot world, was uh, formerly chief of podiatry at Phoenix, Arizona, um, winner of the uh, Roger Pecorero Award from the ADA and currently director of the Association of Diabetic Foot Surgeons in the USA. Uh, and without more, and Bob is going to talk about topical oxygen, what evidence? Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here in Malvern with you, at least virtually. It's a disappointment that I can't be with you uh, in person, but since we in the U.S. are amber, um, I couldn't afford a 10-day quarantine. But nonetheless, I hope I can be with you again. Uh, next year. So with that, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, present this talk uh, to you on uh, topical oxygen. And is there evidence? The critical, the critical question. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. And the primary problem, of course, is low oxygen levels in chronic wounds. Now, we know that the PO2 in arterial blood is about 100 millimeters of mercury normally, edge of a wound about 60 millimeters of mercury. But in the very center of the wound, we know that the area is hypoxic and the partial pressure of oxygen, the PO2, is generally less than 10 millimeters of mercury at the wound uh, center. So severely hypoxic. And that is our problem that we're looking to uh, address. We know that oxygen is essential to healing across the uh, continuum. And we know uh, that in the early inflammatory phase, there's a great deal of uh, a respiratory burst, if you will, with an immune response, the, the uh, migration of uh, neutrophils, macrophages, and reactive oxygen species uh, production. We know that in the proliferative phase, there's the upregulation also of growth factors. There, uh, angiogenesis ensues, fibroblast uh, replication, and collagen synthesis is, is critical, of course. And then the maturation, obviously, remodeling and epithelialization, all of which require uh, energy. And for energy, oxygen is required, of course. So oxygen is essential for wound repair and angiogenesis. ATP oxidative phosphorylation is the energy necessary to drive the biologic processes. Oxygen is essential for this process. NADPH oxidase provides for that respiratory burst that results in superoxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and reactive oxygen species production that are effective for bacterial killing, as well as for the synthesis of reactive oxygen species that provide for intracellular and extracellular signaling and growth factor activity, notably VEGF, PDGF, uh, uh, TGF beta, etc. And of course, oxygen is essential for collagen production as an enzyme cofactor for proleal and lysyl hydroxylase. Um, not on this slide, of course, is the necessity of oxygen for providing for uh, nitric oxide production, another great uh, signaling uh, molecule that helps to stimulate angiogenesis. So what we do know is that normally um, tissue uh, partial pressure of oxygen uh, drives many of the uh, enzymatic reactions, not quite to their 100% activity. Uh, the best is the is, is ATP uh, cell metabolism, which runs at nearly 100% at normal partial pressure of oxygen at 100, as you can see in the green line here on the graph. Uh, collagen production, proline hydroxylase activity is about 80% at normal levels. And of course, NADPH oxidase uh, enzymatic activity is about 60% activity at normal levels. Now, if we look over to the left, at the yellow vertical line, that represents the partial pressure of oxygen in chronic wounds. And we can see it's severely depressed and the entire curve shifts to the left. So there's a great impairment of ATP cell metabolism, proleal hydroxylase and collagen production, as well as uh, uh, infection fighting, the production of reactive oxygen species by NADPH oxidase. So we see that there's really a very physiologic 
uh, impairment in necessary uh, enzymatic activities that are so important for wound care. So then um, let's talk about what can supplemental oxygen do? Well, that can raise obviously the uh, enzymatic activity to above a normal level. And we know that uh, uh, these enz enzymatic activities are, are not quite at 100% at normal PO2 levels, but if we can raise the PO2 level at the wound site above that 100 millimeters of mercury, in some cases up to almost 800 millimeters of mercury, uh, and this all depends upon the, the specific device, then we know that we can augment enzymatic activity. And this is the rationale behind applying topically applied oxygen for healing these uh, chronic wounds. Now, uh, there are several different types of oxygen therapies, and we're well aware of uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy that is well established and well researched, but the data is inconsistent, as I think we'll all agree. And its efficacy in healing chronic uh, DFUs has been disputed by their very own literature, uh, notable as uh, the recent failed Dutch Damocles HBO trial uh, published in 2018. There was a systematic review for non-ischemic DFUs published in Wound Repair Regeneration of 2020 that also uh, stated that there wasn't any positive uh, effect and could not recommend this. And this was in addition to the Margolis to 2013 uh, paper in, uh, I believe it was Diabetes Care, that said the same thing. So therefore, HBOT is not endorsed in the ADA standards of care in 2021. It's not endorsed by the NICE guidelines in the UK. But strangely, the International Working Group 2019 guidelines gave it a weak recommendation despite this very inconsistent um, evidence. And yet also topical oxygen therapy is still controversial despite over 50 years of use and over 30 clinical reports and positive reviews in the medical uh, literature. So uh, again, whether HBO and I, I, I talk about HBO because that's considered the, the gold standard, if you will, of oxygen therapy, despite the fact that the evidence has not been very good. We know we had the Landau paper published in 2010 that was produced with great acclaim, and it showed that a one-year follow-up, 52% uh, of patients people in the active group healed compared to 29% in the placebo group. But that was a one year of follow-up. That was their primary outcome. How do we compare that with typical diabetic foot ulcer trials at 12 weeks, let's say, or 20 weeks? The Fedorco trial similarly um, was, was done and published in 2016 in Diabetes Care, but that was a negative uh, trial. And they, they found that there was no significant difference in healing, um, are facilitating healing in, or, and, and as an indication for uh, amputation at uh, 12 weeks. Uh, this was sham control, however, so that was good, but there have been a lot of questions regarding the uh, rigorousness, if you will, or the robustness of the Fedorco trial. So we look forward to the Santimo trial published in 2018. Now this was, believe it or not, not sham controlled. It was an open label against the standard of care. Why that was done is beyond me. But again, after 12 months, there was no significant difference in healing or difference in effect between the standard of care group or the active HBO group, which was in addition to standard of care. Again, not sham control. So I ask you all, and I know you're all very critical scientists, is this good data to recommend that we consider HBO therapy for the average DFU? I don't, I don't think so. That raises the question, is there evidence to support a biological effect of topically applied oxygen? Well, we know, and many of you have quoted the poorly designed and executed older trial by Leslie, published in 1988 in Diabetes Care. It was a terrible trial, and we'll talk more about that. But that was like a death knell for topical oxygen or, or, or so to speak. We know that there are differing devices and differing delivery systems, and are they similar or are there different effects depend on the delivery system? Um, is continuous diffusion of oxygen the same benefit as pressurized uh, devices? A very valid point, and there have been uh, recent RCTs on both of these that have shown positive effect. 
but most studies or case reports or series on both diabetic foot ulcers and VLUs that generally provide positive clinical results versus comparators in a variety of wounds. There's one negative CDO RCT by a driver in 2017 that didn't show uh, a significant difference between uh, the sham control group, but another more recent CDO uh, RCT showed efficacy in, in University of Texas 1A diabetic foot ulcers. This was published in uh, 2018. We published our uh, RCT on cyclically pressurized uh, topical wound oxygen in diabetes care in 2020, and we showed a, a very significant uh, difference in healing in the active versus the comparative group. Several animal studies have demonstrated positive clinical, histological, and biochemical findings supporting a definite wound healing signal. And then in addition to that, human studies have supported enhanced gene expression and tissue oxygenation as recently as 2020 and as recently as, as uh, 2021, there was a review by uh, our Apollo. So there is certainly evidence to support this. Now, this paper by Fries in, in 2005, this came out of uh, Shondon uh, Sens group in Ohio, uh, created wounds on the back of uh, pigs and it inserted a oxygen electrode at two millimeter depth in the center of, of the active group wounds and compare them to uh, control wounds on the same animal. And they showed some very compelling results here. Um, if you can see in the first uh, graph, uh, pretty much in the, in the center, we can see that when oxygen treatment began uh, at time zero, the, the um, PO2 was about uh, four to five millimeters of mercury, as we said, it's a chronic wound uh, bed. But within four minutes, it went up tenfold to over 40 millimeters of mercury. And that's just with the topical exposure with pressurized oxygen. If we look down at the lower panel, we can see that uh, seven days of topical oxygen therapy were uh, administered. Then it was stopped and then the wounds were followed. And we can see in the lower um, uh, graph on, on this graph, the lower line represented the healing rate or the rate of wound closure of the active versus the uh, solid line representing the comparative group. And we can see that there are significant pretty much from, from uh, right from uh, the first, within the first week. So I think this is fairly compelling evidence. In addition to that, from the same studies, we showed, or they showed, excuse me, in the same pig model, that there was an upregulation of a VEGF in the wounds seven days post wounding. We can see the panel, the panels on the left column are the control, the panels on the right column are the oxygen treated uh, panels or uh, are, 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 uh, wounds, excuse me. And we see that there's an increase in VEGF at day one or day seven, excuse me, post wounding. And we can see the increased uh, green signal there on the right upper panel. And if we look at smooth muscle actin um, in, in the lower uh, panel there, 16 days uh, post wounding, we can see in the oxygen treated wounds, there's more normal architecture for vascular, for uh, vascular genesis, angiogenesis compared to the control wounds on the left. If we look at the graph on the right here, we see that uh, at day 22, there's a significant increase in PO2 in the treated wounds compared to the control wounds. Very good evidence that, that shows us positive wound healing signal. We look further at punch biopsies at 22 days. Again, control is on the left, oxygen treated on, is on the right. And if we look at the upper uh, row, we, uh, we, we can see that there's an abnormal a uh, hyperproliferative epidermis on the left uh, side of the control group compared to a, a rather normal appearing uh, epidermis on the on the oxygen treated side. If we look down on the lower uh, row, we see a disorganized uh, hyperproliferative epidermis again on the control group compared to a more normal uh, hyperproliferative epidermis on the right. The, the blue stain is for granulation tissue. So again, now we're seeing um, we're, we're seeing appropriate histologic evidence that may lend itself towards a better healing. 
So I mentioned this paper early by Larry Lavery and his group published in, in 2020, where they actually did biopsies of wounds treated with a uh, continuous diffusion of uh, oxygen. And they studied 23 uh, DFU uh, patients. However, unfortunately, there were no real controls in, in, in this uh, study. And they really looked at oxygen levels and they looked at cytokine expressions um, uh, post-treatment uh, for four weeks. And as we can see in the graph, uh, even as early as uh, week one, uh, an upregulation of TGF beta, IGF uh, one, and the TGF beta inc increased compared to uh, baseline throughout the whole four weeks. And we also see an upregulation of interleukin uh, six, certainly at uh, week uh, two and certainly at, at week three. So we're seeing a gradual increased uh, uh, synthesis and release of these very important uh, growth factors and cytokines necessary for wound healing. Again, we don't have any controls to uh, compare these results with, but still very interesting. So as I said earlier, there are different types of oxygen, topical oxygen devices. They're not all the same. We know that we have the continuous diffusion of oxygen devices, and there have been uh, now uh, recent trials on each of these uh, three different devices. There is one uh, constant pressure, low constant pressure device. There's really been no uh, clinical trials on this, although some case studies. And we reported on the uh, the uh, right uh, last the last column the cyclically pressurized a topical wound oxygen uh, treatment that pressurized cyclically from 10 millibars up to uh, 50 uh, millibars. And we, we had uh, a very robust trial that provided for very uh, good results. But now almost all these different devices now have good data to support their efficacy in healing uh, these uh, chronic diabetic foot ulcers. Now, is topical oxygen a new concept? Absolutely not. In fact, the first report was in the Lancet uh, by uh, Fisher, and this was published in 1969. Uh, and he came out of uh, New York City and he called the topical hyperbaric uh, oxygen. I'm sorry, you can't see the, uh, the, the title um, of, his, of his paper here, but uh, this was in the Lancet and you can look that up. And he called the topical hyperbaric oxygen. I know we're not supposed to use that term anymore, but that was the original term. And this was just a case series of 52 patients, including VLUs, DFUs, and some osteomyelitis cases. And this was inpatient and it was a homemade or customized unit uh, providing for 22 millimeters of mercury, constant uh, pressure, four to 12 hours a day, 16 days to eight weeks. And there were, of course, some failures as with any uh, treatment. Uh, but he found that the results suggested that topical hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a promising approach in the treatment of superficial ulcerations. He didn't have good results, of course, in osteomyelitis. But this led the stage for further development of this uh, new technology. And then almost 20 years later, Leslie uh, published that paper, which we often call the assassination of topical hyperbaric oxygen. And again, they used, they used the, uh, that term hyperbaric topical oxygen. But many of you would recognize that a trial, a wound healing trial lasting just two weeks in 28 patients looking for primary healing outcomes just doesn't make it nowadays. And that was really the case. 28 patients, observation times, uh, two weeks. These were inpatient, uh, inpatient uh, uh, treated um, subjects. They had a mean duration of foot ulcer of only six weeks. So they were still re relatively uh, acute. Oxygen treatment was uh, two daily 90 minute treatments with 100% oxygen for 14 days. And they looked at differences in outcomes between the control, the standard uh, group and the active group. And lo and behold, they found that uh, topical hyperbaric oxygen was not accelerated in this study. No, no wonder. Uh, then we see that uh, despite that very negative trial, which many of you I'm sure have, have referenced in your talks uh, in the past, Despite that, there's further progress in the development and treatment of 
topical uh, wound, wounds with topical wound oxygen therapy. This one also from SENS group just was a series of clinical case series of a variety of wounds and they found some positive results as well. 72.4% of their wounds healed. Again, it was not randomized and there really wasn't a, a control, but it was still positive. Now, this non-randomized paper was, was comparative. This was published by Blackman in, in 2010. It was prospective and it just involved 28 outpatients and looking at diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, they, they received a topical wound oxygen therapy five days a week plus standard of care compared to a silver dressing standard of care. But they found that the proportion of wounds were healed that healed at 12 weeks was significantly better in the topical oxygen treated group than in the silver dressing group, 82% versus 45%. And I, as always, I, I think the the picture of the uh, Kaplan myograph tells the real story. And you can see in green is the curve for the topical wound oxygen uh, patients where they had a fairly rapid uh, improvement uh, in healing compared to the control group. But again, this was not really randomized. It was comparative, but, but, not, uh, but not the most robust type of a trial, but still positive evidence. Now we come to the Nieder Hours paper in 2018 with continuous diffusion of oxygen. This was a double blind placebo controlled prospective uh, trial using a sham uh, device, UT grade 1A only. And again, they looked at wound healing at 12 weeks as the primary outcome. Now I have some problems with their definition of intention to treat, but 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 they state there was an intention to treat uh, analysis here. And what they found was there was a significant improvement in healing at 12 weeks by the active group compared to the standard of care group. And wound closure was shorter, a 50% wound closure was, was shorter in the active group compared to the um, um, active group. Unfortunately, there were no 12 month uh, outcomes data reported uh, in this trial, but still, uh, a positive uh, result for topical wound oxygen in a randomized prospective uh, sham control uh, trial. Tom Serena has just published his paper just uh, last month using another uh, CDO uh, device, but this was an open label trial for chronic DFUs. It did have the necessary two week run in period. Now they use as their standard of care a TCC with um, an exception of using a, an irremovable uh, cam walker as necessary. And they, they, they compared the TCC standard of care with um, standard of care plus topical oxygen. Um, this was the Inatech uh, device. They had a total of 145 patients. Again, the primary outcome was 100% healing at 12 weeks, not 12 months like HBO trials, but 12 weeks, 100% healing. And they also looked at uh, percent wound area reduction at 12 weeks. And what they found, the ITT results, which I really believe we all have to pay attention to first and foremost, significant uh, improvement in uh, healing in the active group, 44% uh, healing in the active group compared to 28% healing in the standard of care group. This was significant, as you can see uh, there on the graph. Um, even the percent wound area reduction at 12 weeks, there was a significant uh, uh, difference uh, as well. And, the, and, and that was only, however, in the per protocol uh, analysis. Uh, in the ITT analysis, it was not. So again, I don't know how we report per protocol versus ITT, but my bias is we always go with the ITT is first and foremost. Uh, we published this paper, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our, I think, rather robust trial on the topic on the topical wound oxygen therapy using cyclically pressurized topical wound oxygen therapy for the treatment of chronic DFUs. This was the TWO2 study. Um, and this was a sham controlled, double blinded, I think very, very robust trial. And as we can see in the uh, graph on, on the left, our primary outcome was 12 weeks healing. We only did ITT analysis and we found a significant improvement in healing in the active group compared to the sham control group, as you can see. But we also looked at 12 month uh, healing to see if there was any long term effects of this uh, treatment, which stopped at 12 weeks. And we, we did see, as you can see in the panel um, there on, on the right uh, grouping, that there was a significant increase in healing at 12 months as well. Uh, this was significant to the 
um, healing at the for the sham group. So I think we've shown some pretty compelling results that there certainly is an improvement in healing in uh, DFUs um, with uh, topical wound oxygen therapy. And again, this was the pressurized topical wound oxygen therapy. And again, the proof is in the pudding when we look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, right from the week one, we can see the separation in these curves, and this was significant. So when we adjusted our results for wound severity, meeting University of Texas score, um, we, we found that the adjusted odds ratio for active group healing compared to sham control was sixfold. And when we did the Cox uh, proportional hazard modeling, the hazard ratio was almost uh, five uh, in favor of the active group. Again, very, very compelling uh, results here. We have just submitted for publication a, a retrospective cohort study for real world evidence um, looking at topical wound oxygen treated patients compared to those who hadn't received topical wound oxygen patients. This was from two uh, VA centers between January 2012 and 2020. Again, it was a retrospective review of de-identified patient uh, records. Um, and DFU patients uh, wasn't really assigned. It was either the groupings, the cohorts were assigned if they had TWO2 or they didn't have TWO2. Now these patients could also have had additional therapies um, as well, but the uh, discriminator was whether or not they had supplemental topical wound oxygen in addition to standard of care, in addition to whatever else they had treated. Primary outcome studies, outcomes were for patients requiring hospitalization and or amputation within one year, 360 days of the, of the initial wound documentation. So in this, we were looking at one year um, outcomes. And we also used some propensity score matching as well, which is more appropriate for observational retrospective cohort studies. But in the overall group, the unmatched cohorts, we, we can see here that there was an 88% reduction in hospitalizations in the active group at one year and a 71% reduction in amputations in the actively treated group at one year. And these were obviously significant. If we looked at the propensity score matching, uh, where we're uh, matching for age, sex, ethnicity, wound severity, prior amputation, offloading, use of negative pressure, skin substitutes, et cetera. Again, we see similar changes, whereas there's an 82% reduction uh, in the active group for hospitalizations. And similarly, uh, there's a 73% reduction in uh, required amputations at one year in the active group compared to the uh, um, non-treated uh, uh, patients, non-treated non with uh, topical wound oxygen. So again, significant. We looked at logistic regression analysis comparing no TWO2 versus those who were treated with TWO2. Again, this was a match study outcome. And we found that the patients not treated with TWO2 were almost ninefold more likely to be hospitalized than the ones treated with oxygen. And for amputations, again, uh, almost five times greater risk for having an amputation if they were not treated with topical wound oxygen. So fairly compelling retrospective cohort observational uh, results. Uh, furthermore, there have been several recent uh, systematic reviews. This one from India, published in 2019, concluded uh, topical oxygen therapy facilitates wound healing dynamics uh, among patients with chronic diabetic foot ulcers. Again, we can criticize the quality of their, their uh, papers, but they looked at several different types of papers in their analysis, and they uh, concluded that it did facilitate uh, healing. A most recent one by John uh, Golidge and uh, Thanagamani just published uh, as an EPUB in uh, Diabetic Medicine, I think it was in April, uh, looked at a more recent um, systematic review and meta-analysis, and they suggested that topical oxygen therapy does improve the likelihood of DFU healing. However, its effect on amputation and cost effectiveness are unclear, only because these, these particular um, uh, outcomes were not really looked at at this point, but as as we have just shown you on a retrospective review, there was a, a very significant result on amputation. Cost effectiveness uh, review is pending uh, as well, but still further evidence by systematic review that there is an effect of topical wound oxygen. 
So my conclusions, topical oxygen therapies have come of age finally. And this is predicated on animal studies that confirm physiologic and histio histopathological effects, as I've, I've already discussed, there are, as well as human um, studies that we, we've mentioned. There are high level clinical studies that also corroborate enhanced uh, wound healing by using topical oxygen. And here's a controversial statement. The data supporting topical oxygen therapy efficacy is actually better than the data presently available for HBO uh, therapy. But still, the International Working Group recommended that you consider hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And I think that's got to change from, uh, in the future. The data does not support uh, our recommendation. And topical wound oxygen therapy is a perfect adjunctive home-based therapy for the new post a pandemic paradigm. And this was the classic uh, Wound Center Without Walls published by uh, Lee Rogers uh, uh, last year. Perfect home-based therapy that patients can administer themselves, highly adherent to therapy and highly effective, very, very easy for the patients to comply with the, th with the therapies. You can also use this therapy adjunctively with other advanced therapies, tissue implants, autologous blood clots that I know many of you are very um, uh, likely to use, autologous skin implants, uh, post skin grafts, etc. cetera. Uh, there are a few complications. As I said, there are high patient adherence and satisfaction, and more double-blind studies are underway, but they must be intention to treat. Um, I think no matter what we do, we must use intention to treat studies. So with that, I want to thank you um, very, very much. Uh, I hope this uh, was useful for you. And I certainly look forward to being with you there in Malvern uh, again next year. Uh, thank you again. And I hope to see you all very soon. Bye-bye.